image, a cartoon, a piece of art is something you look at. And sometimes it's the other way around. It's the image that seems to be looking at you. Let us tell you the story behind this image. On January 21st, 2015, I had to make the hardest phone call of my life. It was half past three Texas time, and I dialed the number of the Huntsville prison, and I asked to speak to Arnold Prieto. This man is Arnold Prieto. In 93, when he was 20 years old, he was convicted for murder of an elderly couple during a robbery. Prieto refused to testify against his two accomplices in exchange for a reduced sentence. He was the only one sentenced to death. When he sent us this drawing at the end of 2014, Prieto had already received his execution date. He knew the 21st of January 2015 would be the last day of his life. When that day came, he had the right to make a few last phone calls that's when he asked to speak to us. So I called Prieto, and uh, he wanted to talk about art, uh, about drawing techniques. He told me I learned how to paint in prison. My drawings will still be there when I'm no more. Our conversation lasted only a few minutes, often interrupted by the guards. Then he said, I have to go now. Before hanging up, he said, have a nice day. Three hours later, Arnold Prieto gave his last statement. He said, there are no endings, only beginnings. And as the injection began, he said, wow, I can smell it. At 6.31 PM, Texas time, Arnold Prieto was pronounced dead. This woman witnessed Arnold Prieto's execution. Her name is Dina Milito. She became a strong opponent of the death penalty after being herself the victim of a violent crime. At the age of 20, she was, left, she was left dead, almost dead, in her backyard. She has been to hell and back, but today she has one belief. She says, I know that the execution of a human being doesn't contribute to peace of mind and justice. His death warrant was signed on May 12th, so that's when his execution started. You know, they stick a needle in your arm at the end and the actual death part of it takes two or three minutes, but the execution starts the day the warrant's signed. So my feeling was that that's the worst part. I mean, the waiting and the hoping and the saying goodbye to everybody is that's the hardest part, you know? I mean, I feel like it's torture. I feel like if people knew what people went through it's torture. It, it's horrible. The last visits, a mother saying goodbye to her child, the sounds of his mother crying after their last phone call at the hospitality house are sounds I never want to hear again. I never want to hear a mother crying like that again. If, if anybody heard that, I just don't see how you could say that that was justice, especially if there's a shadow of a doubt, you know? Windows on Death Row is an exhibition that brings together art from inside and outside the prison walls, because images often speak louder than words. On one side, we have asked some of the best American political cartoonists to send us their take on capital punishment. This is from Clay Bennett of the Chattanooga Free Press in Tennessee. This is uh, Joel Pett at the Lexington Herald Leader in uh, Kentucky. As for the views from inside the prison, we reached out to death row inmates. We asked them to be witness and to draw their daily lives. Armando Macias from St. Quentin Prison in California gave us this, a hard bunk, a metal sink and toilet, and a small table in a tiny cell. To put this project together, we visited maximum security prisons around the United States and made direct contact with 30 inmates who accepted to be part of this. And so tonight we are taking you with us on this journey with art from the exhibition with videos uh, we made and part of a graphic novel series 
we did for the New York Times, we invite you to open a window on death row. In the summer of 2014, when we started working on this project, the death penalty was in the spotlight again. Europe had banned companies from exporting little drugs to the US. The little drugs on which prison relied on were not available anymore. States started experimenting with new death cocktails. Several executions went wrong that year. Inmates agonized on the gurney for 30, 40 minutes before dying. In December 2014, with the help of two art teachers, we were able to organize a drawing workshop on death row. In Nashville, 10 inmates were willing to take part in our projects. We were going to meet 10 guys who had been sentenced to death. So we took this road, the road leading to Riverbend Maximum Security Institution, a prison and Duminos very well. When they first arrive here, inmates are placed in Unit 2, Level C, strict solitary confinement for 18 months, shackled most of the time. If they behave well, they're transferred to level B, slightly less strict. It's only after years that those who behave well are upgraded to level A, where they have writing and drawing workshops. Those are the guys we're going to meet. We pass security. We walk through razor wire fences, double gates through which we have to be buzzed. And we enter a room where 10 men in white prison jumpsuits are waiting for us. This man walks straight up to me, Gary Cohn, 67 years old, 33 years spent on death row. And he tells me right away, I'm guilty. I killed a man. I came back from Vietnam a drug addict, and I knew how to use guns. This is one of his drawings. It's called How to Lose a Year in Four Easy Steps. It's a true story. It actually happened to Cohn. In the first panel, a guard finds some rotten apple juice in his cell. Cohn is accused of brewing juleps, a homemade prison whiskey. He's sent to the disciplinary board. They sentence him to one year back to Unit B, strict solitary confinement for a whole year. Last year, after more than 30 years on the road, Gary Cohn died in prison. This artwork is by Harold Wayne Nichols on Tennessee Death Row. He wrote, it's been 26 years since I've seen the stars in the sky. Harold, also gave us a letter with this painting, a letter addressed to you. He writes, prison has taught me the importance of the little things in life. When was the last time you drove out beyond the lights of the city just to see the stars? Hope, I hope you will take time to do that and to enjoy the little things life has to offer. And then there's Abu, the wise man of the group, an old man now. This is what he chose to draw. It's about life making its way into his cell. In this completely sealed off maximum security prison, an ant, a bee, and a mouse come to visit him from time to time. Most of these inmates have committed terrible crimes, but our project is not about crime. It's about what comes after, about our collective response to crime, about the shortcomings of the justice system, about the effects of solitary confinement. Many of the guys who participate in our project have spent more than 20 years in their cell. And one of the toughest places to spend that time is Texas. This is the Polonsky unit in Livingston, Texas. You can tell uh, which block houses the death row inmates. So on the left, you have the regular cells, double row of windows. And then you have the death row cells, only a tiny opening, six feet above ground. 
that's where we meet Abel Ochoa, 45 years old. He's been locked up for the past 15 years in solitary confinement. Now, let us explain what solitary confinement means in a place like Texas. Inmates are locked up 23 hours a day in a cell like this, waiting for the day of their execution. The rule from day one in that prison is no physical contact. The only contact is when the guards handcuff them. Twice a week, they have two hours outside, two people at a time, each in his own cage. He came up with a basketball game, the first who makes 10 baskets win. In this prison, breakfast is served at 2.30 a.m., lunch at 10 a.m., dinner at half past three in the afternoon. We were allowed to interview Abel Ochoa. Listen what, to what he had to say. This environment's made to break you down as a person. It, emotionally and mentally, it's designed to break you down. We don't, we don't have contact visits, as you see. We don't have church services. We don't have group recreation. Um, you know, we don't have a work program. We don't have no TVs. So it's, it's designed to break you down. Now, at the same time, knowing that, it's up to you as an individual not to let them break you down. It's up to you to find something positive to do with your time that you have which, um, like, like I share with people, we have more time than you all do have out in the world. We have more time to read books, to get, we, we can get educated here. We can get our GED, we can do Bible studies here. We, you know, some people write books, some people, you know, do artwork, you know, and just, that you have to find something positive with your time. And that's something that, that, that advice was given to me when I got here, and guys knew that this was my first time being locked up. They said, you better find something positive to do with your time, if not, you're going to lose your mind. And that's true. If you don't, you know, practice, keep your mind working, something positive, something creative, you're going to you lose your sanity. So every day, Abel does the same things. He reads his Bible, prays, listens to preachers on the radio. On Sunday, August 4th, 2002, Ochoa murdered five family members, including his women and children. Abel was a drug addict. Crack turned him into a killer. When we asked him if he had a message to pass on to you, he said, do you know anybody on drugs? Tell them to get away from it. It will mess up their mind. On the day of his execution, he'll have his last visits. Remember, no physical contact whatsoever. Only, so it's gonna happen only through these glass windows. Then, he will be taken in a white minivan along the road that leads to Huntsville, Texas, a 15-minute drive through green landscapes. Huntsville is the national capital of death penalty. Since 1976, Texas has executed 543 people, five times more than the top second and third states, Virginia and Oklahoma. This is the Waltz unit in Huntsville. The execution chamber is there on the left at the end of this wing. One day of May 2015, we are standing right there. It's raining. At 6 p.m., a man will be executed. His name is Derek Charles. He's what they call a low-profile inmate. African-American, clear-cut murder case, no support network. Just a few of us are standing here, staring at the clock. At 6.50 p.m., the door opens and the prison spokesperson comes out. My name is Jason Clark, Jason, J-A-S-O-N, Clark, C-L-A-R-K. Derek Charles was executed tonight. Uh, he did make a brief last statement. Uh, when asked by the warden if he'd like to make a last statement, he said, I'm ready to go home. It was at that point that the lethal dose of pentobarbital was administered and he lost consciousness immediately. Uh, Charles was pronounced deceased 25 minutes after the lethal dose began. Uh, he did not make uh, eye contact with the victims. He stared uh, straight ahead. Any questions? Do you have any family members there? Uh, 
Charles had no uh, witnesses present. Uh, there were witnesses of the victims that were present. And again, he did not look over at them or address them in any way. Can you tell us more about his last day? Uh, Charles spent most of today, um, let me start that over. Uh, Charles, over the last several days, has had extended visits with family and friends. Uh, this morning, he would have had extended visits, and then he would have been taken midday uh, from the Polinsky unit death row uh, to the Walls unit uh, here. And that's where he spent uh, all of the afternoon. His last meal? Uh, last meal that was served to Charles, which was served to everyone else here, uh, was baked chicken, mashed potatoes, carrots and green beans. Phil Archer, journalist at a local TV station, also witnessed the execution. It's the first time Phil Archer saw a man die. I can, I can tell you what happened. We were let in. There are two viewing rooms. Uh, the witnesses for the victims from their family were in the viewing room across from us. We couldn't actually see them. We were in a viewing room with guards. Uh, Mr. Charles had no one, family or friends, there for him. So we were let in there. I think we got in there about 6.05. Um, at 6.11, he made the only statement he made. He, he was asked, uh, there was a warden and a chaplain in the room with him, and he was asked if he had any last statement to make, and he said, no, I'm ready to go home. Uh, he had his eyes closed as he said that. Um, he opened his eyes briefly and looked at the ceiling and then closed them again. Um, he seemed to go to sleep about, well, shortly after that. It didn't take him long after he made that statement that he seemed to relax. Uh, and then finally, uh, he was pronounced dead at 636. Um, and that is that. That's all, pretty much all that happened. Or is it the total of what happened? You know, I shouldn't say all that happened. How is it to witness this? It, well, it's a sobering. It's not something I think anyone would uh, choose to do. I'm doing it because it's part of my job. But uh, it's, uh, there's uh, nothing to be recommended about watching someone die. Not far from the Waltz unit, you can find the largest prison cemetery in the U.S. with 3,000 graves. The bodies that are not claimed by the families are buried here by fellow inmates. We met a man who saw death in the eyes, here, at San Quentin State Prison, north of San Francisco. It's Sunday morning. We are lining up with uh, visiting families. The rules are very strict. No cell phones, no objects. We just allowed a little money to buy the inmate a snack. I turn out to have a $50 bill in my pocket. The guard tells me only coins are loaded, but there is a changing machine right there behind you. Now imagine changing 50 bucks into quarters. It makes the same sound than when you win the jackpot in Las Vegas, except in Vegas you don't look stupid. This is the visiting room. We look around, trying to find the guy we are here to meet. He's actually right behind us. Kevin Cooper is in a cage. So they handcuff him. They let us in. The door is shut and the handcuffs are taken off. Now you understand why they call it a contact visit. Cooper says, the state of California tried to kill me. On December 17, 2003, he got his date of execution. From that day, he was put on death watch, a special cell with 24-7 video monitoring. They take his last photo, his last measurements. At 6 p.m., the execution team arrives. They strip search him. Kevin Cooper says, the place is so cold, it feels like a morgue. He refuses the last meal, doesn't want food from those who are going to kill him.
four hours before the execution at, at 8.15 p.m., the phone rings. The United States Supreme Court has decided to stay. Kevin Cooper's execution doesn't happen very often. He says, I felt life enter my body again. Later in the prison, Kevin Cooper saw some of these men again, the men who had volunteered for his execution. This painting is by Kevin Cooper. It's a message to his lawyer. It's called Free Me. This one, he called it, it's a generational thing. When we visited him, Kevin explained, in the prison you can find a dad, a son, and a grandson, all locked up at the same time. The little guy in the front, he's wondering, is this what's in store for me? At the beginning of this project, we were told on death row, you'll meet African-Americans, Latinos, whites, but never a rich person. That was true. Those who can afford a good lawyer escape the death sentence. And it's not only the size of your wallet that counts. Race also plays a crucial role. This piece is by Kenneth Reams on Arkansas death row. It's called The Last Mile. Reams pictured that last corridor leading to the execution chamber. Inmates call it the last mile. What happens once you take those very last steps? Listen to James Willett, former director of Huntsville Prison. During his time there, Willett oversaw 83 executions. The officer opened the door. I would tell the inmate, follow me. I'd turn my back to him. I'd come into the chamber, and when he got in, I would tell him to get up on the gurney and lie down, of course, with his head at that end. And the officers, there would be about five of them, and they're, you know, they've done this a bunch of times, so they very quickly get those straps on the inmate. I would dismiss them back to the cell block, and then I would walk over to that door and open it, and there would be two medical people in there. They would come out and start an IV in each arm. One of them is live and the other one is for backup. Then they would go back in the room. That leaves the chaplain and I in there with the inmate. The staff would bring the two groups of witnesses. Uh, the inmates' witnesses would be with one staff member. Get them in, then you bring in the victim's witnesses and put them in the other room. Once that was done, I would tell the inmate he could make his last statement. Most of them made a last statement. Most of them were short. Once they were through, I would give a signal to the executioner that he could start doing what he had to do. In about 30 seconds, that inmate would take his last breath. And maybe a minute and a half, two minutes from then, the, the executioner would give me a signal telling me that he had all the fluids in the body. Just as a precautionary, I would wait three more minutes, and then I would open the door to the cell block again. And there was a doctor waiting in there. He would come out and do all those things that doctors do to pronounce someone dead. You know, a flashlight in the eye, checking for a pulse, a stethoscope to the heart, that kind of thing. And then he would give a time of death and he'd go back into the cell block. At that point, the staff takes the uh, uh, witnesses out one group at a time. And when they're out, the Huntsville Funeral Home would come and take the body to the funeral home. So you were, you were the one giving the signal for the execution to start? Yes. Did you feel guilty? Did you feel like you were killing someone? I never felt guilty about it. Yeah. Um, it's a hard process, it was for me, to watch. But I always figured myself as being, uh, if you will, a cog in a wheel. I mean, there's a lot of things happen before this guy winds up here on this gurney. Uh, in fact, I've thought before how hard it would be to be someone who was on a jury for this person who had said, we find this guy guilty and I'm voting for his death. How hard it must be for them on that night, you know. Just a cog in a wheel. Now listen to the story of Kenneth Reams, the man who drew this. 
Kenneth grew up on these streets in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, a city also called Crime Bluff. He had just turned 18 when he drove along this road with his friend Alfred. Alfred was about to graduate from high school and he needed $40 to pay his cap and gown. The two men decided to rob an ATM machine, this ATM machine. Alfred panicked and shot the victim. An innocent man died that day. The teens had one gun, one shot was fired, but the prosecutor made the same offer to both. Plead guilty and you'll get life without parole. If not, I'll request a death penalty. Alford, who had, who had pulled the trigger, took the deal. Kenneth did not. Today, Kenneth says, how could I plead guilty to something I didn't do? I trusted the justice system. Kenneth Reams was sentenced to death. Today, he's, he's still fighting to get a new trial. His lawyer, George Kendall, is, with here tonight, is here with us tonight, and he'll tell you more about it later. Sisterhood is the title of this painting made by Ndume Olatushani. While he was sitting on death row in Tennessee, he became a great painter. To escape the walls, he painted the world he was dreaming of, the people he wanted to meet. Ndume says, thanks to art, I never felt like I was their prisoner. Freedom is a state of mind. In 1985, Ndume was sentenced to death for a murder he had not committed. He spent 28 years, 28 years, almost half more than uh, half his life, behind bars for a crime he had not committed. And that crime happened in Memphis, a city where he had never been to. It took Ndume 20 and his lawyers 20 years of legal fighting and lots of help to walk out free. If he had been detained in a state like Texas, Ndume could be a dead man today. Luckily enough, Ndume Olatushani is with, is with us tonight. Please welcome him. Thank you. Do me. You say that art saved your life? Yeah, art did save my life. Uh, Tell us how. Come, yeah, art yeah, did save my life. Uh, I mean, uh, but for that, I wouldn't be here. I, I think that, uh, you know, every time I have a chance to just kind of see this and just kind of be a part of it, I'm always reminded of how fortunate I am. Uh, you know, that I was able to find art in a space that I actually did because it was through my art that people were able to, uh, people were able to be drawn a little closer and because of that kind of proximity uh, with my art, they was able to learn about my situation. And so, yeah, not only did art save my life and that allowed for me to find freedom in a four by uh, nine foot cell, it also, too, uh, like I said, uh, literally, uh, you know, but for uh, the lawyers here, and, and I, I want to say this here because I think that, you know, I didn't had, uh, you know, a lot of opportunities to share my story with people, but tonight I have the, uh, the privilege of actually being here with uh, three of the lawyers that worked on my case, and I certainly want to uh, have them at some point. I don't want to take a whole lot of time because if you want to learn about my story, you can certainly go on the internet. I mean, I could tell you how what art did for me and uh, how important it is that an institution like this and other individuals, institutions, organizations support the work that not only they doing, but uh, find a way to support people sitting in that situation because, but for art, I wouldn't be standing here. But like I said, the thing for me is, uh, uh, I mean, it's really important to have these guys here with me tonight because, but for them, I'm telling you, but for the, uh, the lawyers at Cleary, David, both of the Davids and uh, Jonathan Blackman here, that uh, uh, I wouldn't be standing here. And I ain't under, no illusion about that. No illusion about uh, how fortunate I am to actually be here. So oh, I saved my life. Could you tell us what it was like, like a normal day on death row, what it was like for you? What did you do in this small cell? 
I think, uh, um, I mean, I was one of them people that, first off, I, know, I knew that I shouldn't have been there in the first place. And, uh, uh, and I never internalized the belief that I actually would be executed for something that I didn't do. And I always believed that one day I would actually be free. And so for me, uh, uh, I always tried not to have a typical day at death row. I mean, prison, prison is a, a mundane place. I mean, you got routine, routine, routine. I mean, I could actually tell you the day of the week based on the food that we was actually eating that uh, you could tell the day of the week. That's how routine uh, prison was. So for me, I would always try to break up the space to the little space that I was actually in by trying to create, uh, you know, just uh, something different where I wasn't having a typical, uh, typical day on death row. But <clears throat> I spent a lot of time, I, I chose not to, I know in Texas, people ain't even allowed to have TVs. And I, I mean, if you ever been in a situation, you ain't gotta do nothing but maybe go in your bathroom because most bathrooms that people go in every day is bigger than some of the prison cells that people are actually sitting in. But you can just go in there and get some idea of what it might be like to spend years upon years sitting in a space like that, especially without TV. For the first 10 years of my imprisonment, I chose not to have a TV because I didn't want to get lost in that little space, spending hours watching TV and getting nothing done. So I read a lot of books. Uh, I was one of them people, like I said, I always knew that one day I would be free. I chose to get a, D, a GED while I was sitting on death row. So I ain't go to death row uh, waiting to die. I actually went to death row and I was full of life. I was full of life, so I was, I, I was living. Most, most inmates don't break, are, bro are broken by the system. How was it, how, did you witness this when you were there? I did. I mean, you, uh, I tell people, uh, I mean, you can go to any, any prison and when you go there, you, you come up to it, but for defenses, you could say that it looked like a college campus. But the, th the reality is that it belies the truth about the mental and psychological uh, deprivations that people are dealing with every day, especially on death row. So yeah, I seen people came in just the same as I was, and in a matter of a few years, bro uh, broken by the process, uh, and ended up on psycho, uh, psychotropic drugs and all type of medication, forcibly being medicated, uh, just so when the time come, that they can tell the court that this person was competent. So you have people being forcibly medicated. Uh, so yeah, uh, yeah, certainly death row and uh, prison generally. I mean, people sit back and, you know, you uh, hear and see this stuff on TV about what prison is. But prison is a hard life, and death row certainly is a, a, it's even harder because you're living with this idea that you, uh, I mean, you literally walking in the shadow of death. And you, yeah, you imposed a discipline on yourself. You gave up on having a TV. What else you 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 uh, were able to get only one meal a day? Yeah, for me, I mean, you they, taught yourself. Uh, yeah, that was one of the things that uh, uh, for a lot of years when I was in prison, I, I chose uh, uh, to, uh, because in prison, everything is used as a control mechanism. TVs, uh, food, uh, being able to get outside and wreck yards, all this stuff is used as a control mechanism. So for me, uh, uh, I, I was one of the people I, I never wanted to lift weights or uh, I was saying earlier that I used to exercise in my cell because, uh, and I call them celestinics, uh, you know, the calisthenics. I would do all my exercise in my cell, uh, and I did that based on, uh, uh, I conditioned my body that I would, uh, you, uh, you know, just, if I was able to get a really good breakfast, then I was able to, uh, uh, you know, go through the day, and, uh, and that's how I chose to do it, because I never wanted to be in a position where, oftentimes, when stuff go on in prison, the people come, they, lock the prison down, they, uh, the officers then have to do the work, they're bringing food in, and so they do everything that they can, they just kind of mess with you. Uh, uh, you on a sack lunch, you eating two sack lunches a day, so for me, uh, I knew that as long as I wasn't dependent on that, then I, I never could be just kind of broken and bent by this process. And uh, last question before we want to bring more people to the stage. Uh, t so 28 years behind bar, the whole world has changed. It has. did. <laughs> it did. So how, what was the most difficult part of it? 
you know, a change for uh, I was one of them people, like I said, I was always trying to prepare for freedom. But the thing that uh, the thing that was is most hard for me and it's still kind of hard for me is this whole technological leap that happened while I was away for nearly three decades. So, uh, Come on, you have the latest iPhone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I got an eight year old daughter. She know more about it than I do. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, that's uh, technology. That technology. That was the thing for me because when you're sitting in prison, uh, during the time that I was sitting in prison, and this is, I think that one of the things that people should understand about uh, prison, especially, I mean, aside from the death penalty, uh, you know, prison is a huge industry, and so every, uh, I mean, hundreds of billions of dollars is involved in locking people up, and in this country, that simply means somebody going to jail. And so when you go in prison, uh, like uh, you were saying, there's nothing inside the prison trying to prepare people to come out and have, uh, be a productive people in society. And so uh, because you need them to re keep recidivating back into the system. And so during the time that I was actually in prison, they actually took typewriters out of the prison. Now, and you know how antiquated that technology is, but they took typewriters out of the prison from uh, those of us who were sitting there. And, and it, it, but there was no, no, no value, no penological value at all to taking typewriters from people, except that what it does that when you have society moving toward everything did on the computer, you can't, uh, why would you take typewriters, the very thing that somebody might be able to learn a typing skill so they could uh, be able to navigate a computer, uh, they took that out of there. So, uh, uh, so yeah, I, uh, yeah, uh, prison is, like I said, you hear this stuff, but prison is actually a, a whole life. I mean, it's, there's no joke sitting in prison. Now you were talking about your lawyers. Yeah. It took 20 years, 25 lawyers, 17,000 pro bono hours yeah. to get you out. And I'm not talking about your wife. <laughs> yeah, hey, listen. So perhaps we would like David and the lawyers involved to come up. Yeah, please. I Stay. Think Yeah. I want to say one quick thing in terms of, uh, uh, like I said, but for these guys, I'm telling you, I wouldn't be standing here. Like she said, my wife, uh, I met my wife through, the, uh, through my art, and it was through my wife that uh, clearly got involved in my case. And like I said, ain't no question in my mind, but for the work that these guys did and dedicating their uh, the life to me to save my life, I wouldn't be here. I'm saying, and uh, it's such a privilege for me to be actually be up here with you guys in this particular space where people are trained to come out and do the very thing that you guys are doing. So I hope if you got law students in here, don't if somebody tell you that they're innocent of a crime, don't just write them off. Don't just write them off because you could save their life like they did, man. Yeah. I just wanted to ask one last question because the one thing that Ndume didn't say about his um, life and his case, uh, Ndume has not been exonerated. He took an Alford plea, which means that he got no financial compensation. The people who did that mistake, who led him to be in jail for so long, never were accountable of that. So I was wondering perhaps we want to adjust this? I just want to say one thing. I, I, when she said it was a mistake, in my case, it wasn't a mistake, but they can certainly tell you about the Alfred plea. <laughs> well, it, it was not a mistake uh, on the prosecution's part. I think they knew what they were doing. They concealed evidence that would have vindicated Indumi. Uh, they coerced witnesses uh, to give testimony uh, to support what they were trying to prove. Um, they made deals with the witness and then lied about it. When it came to trial, this was a trial of an African-American man accused of killing a white man. Um, they used what's called peremptory strikes to uh, get rid of every single potential African-American juror, all six of their strikes, to get an all-white jury to try a black man accused of killing a white man. So this was not a mistake. These guys were not playing fair. Uh, they were not uh, seeking justice. Um, the Alfred plea uh, came it was after 17 years, Dewey was 53 years old, we managed to get his conviction overturned. 
um, at that point, the state could have sought the death penalty again. We'd actually gotten the death penalty overturned years earlier, but they could have sought it again. Knowing the Memphis prosecutor's office, which New York Times just profiled in an article in August, is up to the same nonsense, the same concealing of evidence. Um, knowing them, they very well may have sought the death penalty again. That would have meant in Dume couldn't have been released on bail pending another trial. Knowing the delays that we uh, dealt with in our case, again, it took 17 years because of the long lags. A motion would be made to a court. A year would pass before the court would even rule on the motion. Then that would have to be appealed. Two years would pass before we'd get a, a ruling on the appeal. So the process of getting to a trial to, to uh, show his innocence, to prove it to a jury, could have gone on for years. All the while, uh, Ndume would have been in prison. So it was time to get Ndume out. It was time to put all of that behind him. Um, and I think I'll let Ndume speak uh, as to whether you know, that was the right decision to make. But I, I think it clearly, uh, from our perspective, it clearly was. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, the thing that, uh, you know, I, I t it, the people offered me a 25 year sentence in the middle of my trial when I was going to trial and I refused it then, and all the way up until uh, I had to counsel these guys and my family coming and telling me that uh, it was probably in my best interest to actually go and do this here because it would allow for me to walk out sooner rather than later. Uh, I, chose, I chose to actually enter into this effort plea because I was actually prepared to just, uh, they had already took 28 years from me, so I was actually prepared to just sit it out and, uh, uh, and just go through this process. But uh, when I think back now, I'm, I'm, I'm so glad that I had good counsel and people that I trusted to come and help me make this decision because the last five years since I've been home, June, this past June 1st has been five years since I've been home. And it's been such an amazing, amazing five years. I've had so many opportunities. Um, look at me, I'm here. I'm saying I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just want to capture one thing very briefly. I think, Patrick, you asked about uh, the passage of time and the, the advent of technology. Um, so on the day of Ndume's release, uh, he was able to, uh, to go uh, move in with his now wife, Anne-Marie Moyes, who uh, supported Ndume over the years, uh, became interested in his case. Uh, that inspired her to go to law school at Vanderbilt. Uh, graduated first in her class, yeah. uh, became a public <laughs> defender, and uh, lived in a lovely bungalow house in East Nashville. So Ndume was incredibly fortunate, not only to have been released, but to have this lovely life to move into. Uh, and one of the great uh, kind of poignant moments and joys of Ndume's release, he was released in the morning after several days of waiting for the paperwork and mm -hmm. came out to you know huge hugs from Anne-Marie and me and all of the other supporters, and I flew home to New York. But one of the great joys of his release was the next morning getting an email from my client. And if you ever represented someone on death row, you don't get emails from your clients on death row. And um, I don't know if you remember it, but it was, you know, David, wow, I'm just sitting here looking at Anne-Marie. She was asleep. It was six in the morning, you know, looking at the cat. The cat is sitting in your lap. You know, you're out. You're living your life. Um, so I think you know, that, that, that moment and that uh, freedom, uh, I think, made it all worthwhile. Thank you. We leave it Thank to you. you. Thank you. Stay on stage. We'll be moving out.